I want to introduce our next speaker. Logan Hicks is an artist extraordinaire. Uh, when I started putting this conference together, he was one of the first artists, if not the first artist, I thought about having here. Uh, in part because uh, Artist, hands down, is one of the nicest guys in the game. I remember meeting him, uh, oh gosh, 2003, maybe four, at Crew West Gallery in Alhambra at the Boys on the Hood uh, show. He and I struck up a conversation, and I just thought, wow, this guy's brilliant and he's nice. That's rare. Um, and uh, I've watched his career just grow and grow and grow. He's uh, debuted his work all over the world, including Dubai and very recently in Hawaii at Pow Wow. Yet again, I don't even know how many times he's been at Pow Wow. Uh, he'll tell you, I'm sure. Uh, he's uh, shown in you know all over the world, Dubai. Uh, he just did the Bowery Wall not too long ago in New York. Uh, he's a wonderful uh, human being, a great artist. And without further ado, uh, let's welcome Logan Hicks. Thank you very much. Um, man, what, what a presentation to follow up on. I don't have one single chart for you guys to look at, just so you know. I just got some pictures that are going to be running through. Um, my name is Logan Hicks. I am a um, New York-based uh, stencil artist. I work on, in photorealistic, multi-layered stencils, usually dealing with the urban landscape or um, whatever environment that people are within. Um, and so, first of all, th thanks to Scott, everyone here at uh, Not Real Art. Um, it's been a pleasure coming out here and actually revisiting LA. I moved from LA to New York in 2007, so uh, it's been a while since I've been here. But um, you know, when Scott first asked me to speak at the conference, I'd asked him, "What you know? What do you want me to talk about? What's the focus?" And you know, he simply said, uh, "You know, what advice would you give a, a younger version of you?" And you know, I thought about it for. A couple weeks and came to the realization that like the advice I would give a younger me is, is kind of irrelevant. I mean the, the world in which I I came up in no longer exists. Um, you know the, the type of art that I'm doing when I started doing it wasn't really defined. There wasn't a movement. There wasn't you know websites and blogs and magazines and everything that, that came out. So it, it posed an interesting dilemma for me and so um, you know the the approach that I had back then wouldn't wouldn't really help me if I were to try to duplicate that today. So um, I guess in, in that sense, I don't have this like you know bullet point thing of uh, do this, you know, look them in the eye, shake them, shake their hand, get the number, and all that stuff. But um, what I do have is is a sort of an approach to life in general that um, hopefully you can sort of garner from the from my story and how I came came up. Um, to give you an idea, I went to college in the early '90s. Um, in Baltimore, and um, you know, at the time, street art wasn't around. It just was kind of one of this. People just sort of, sort of did art, and occasionally would put it on the street. But it wasn't this sort of formalized thing. It was more of a nobody's buying this stuff, nobody's showing this stuff. It's taking up room in my studio, and I'd rather that like the general public that doesn't know anything about art see my work instead of it just sort of sitting in my studio. And so people would go out and they would put it up, but um, you know, it, it wasn't a formalized thing. Um, I finished up college, had gone the four years, found myself six credits short of a degree, and really kind of just reflected on, on where I was going and what I wanted to do. And I came to the realization I just, I just couldn't go back, not, not for like a fifth year, even if it was only for six credits. So I went ahead and left art school without a degree. I started a screen printing business because at the time, that's all throughout college, I was screen printing at a, a commercial screen print shop to pay the bills. And so I decided, you know, fuck it, I'll just start a screen print business. At the time, I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything really about running a full screen print shop. I knew how to screen print. I didn't know the, the dynamics behind it. And so I did everything I could to ask other business owners, read up on stuff, go to the library, uh, you know, whatever else I could do to sort of get the information that I needed to, to get a, a firm footing on business. And... The second reason that I did that was that after going to art school, at the time that I went to, to art school, it was, it was sort of a different world where like, there was this kind of real uh, kind of mixed media collage, talk about your feelings a lot. And not that I'm a, a soulless monster, but that really wasn't my, my approach with art. 
And so screen printing provided me this sort of tangible hands-on thing. I could, I could do something, I could see it, I could make something, I could sell, sell it, I could see the money. And there was this direct line of um, you know, commerce of like from concept to, to payment. And, and that was sort of the foundation of, of you know, why I went ahead and, and uh, did the screen printing. And uh, as my screen printing business grew, I realized that um, you know, even if you're working for yourself when you're printing other people's designs, you're still working for other people. And so I, I kind of wanted the, that complete freedom that, that came with not answering to a single soul. So you know, I continued in the screen printing, but I started think, thinking forward to the future. Um, and I, I bought a big warehouse with, you know, and when I bought it, I had the idea I was gonna grow and be this like monster printer and everybody was gonna come to me and I was gonna be the guy. And, uh, but the, the screen printing business only took up maybe, I don't know, 10% of the total warehouse space. So what I started doing was throwing these parties. And, you know, I would have like bands come and play, I would have artists come and show their work. And around this time is when like Juxtapose Magazine came out. And I remember opening Juxtapose and looking at it. And for the first time since I had left art school, there was a soul to what I was seeing. I mean, the, these things that, that kind of came from a blue collar background or like a, a, a sort of pedestrian understanding of art, you know, skateboard graphics, graffiti, graphic design, um, hot rod culture, all that stuff appealed to me, but it was elevated to the level of art. And so for me, that really resonated with me. And what I would do is, when I was doing these parties, I would look through Juxtapose, and if I saw an artist that I liked, I would like, I'd just email him, hey man, I'm this guy in Baltimore, I'm doing this thing, do you want to show some art? One of the people that I emailed was Shepard Ferry at the time. And both of us were very early in our careers. I ended up selling a ton of his prints. The next year he came out and uh, to the next show that I did. We started talking, he confirmed what I had suspected, which was that, that there was a real spirit in California, that the, the style of art that was going on out there was different than I went to art school. So I said, fuck it, packed my bags, moved out to San Diego and uh, started my career. Sold off my screen print shop. And after moving out there, I realized like, well, I don't have the screen print thing going on. How the hell am I gonna make money and what am I gonna do? So I started doing stencils. Stencils essentially are a poor man's screen print. And uh, you know, the, the same principles of screen printing is what I applied to the stenciling. And so you know, I do a one color stencil here or there. Of course, like for me, like I always wanna push things. So I did another layer and another layer and added like extra color and then, you know, the momentum of that just kinda continued to grow and uh, I finally found that sweet spot of having like a hands-on medium, but also having sort of a practical thing that I could, could kind of create with like the art school sensibilities interpreted into something that was native to me. Over time, I just kept adding more layers, kept expanding on it, and there was really nobody doing, you know, stencil paintings, well, like this, and so, Kind of being the first allows you that freedom to fuck up a lot, you know? There was no one to turn to, no one to ask questions to, no one to tell you that you're doing it wrong. You just kind of forge straight ahead and, and you found your own path. And so, you know, with the, pardon me while I look here. You know, so I kept going and, and eventually got a show here or there. But you know, the, the first six years of my career was spent simply learning the medium of stenciling. And I think you, your artwork is like a language that only you know how to speak. And in the first part of your career, it's, it's your job to learn how to speak your language fluently. Now, speaking a language doesn't mean that you can then turn on and write like a, a great novel. And so for me, I kind of think of it the same way with art. So for six years, I learned how to master the medium. After the six years, I started then turning to like the content, what was like the idea behind it? What was the belief behind it? Is there a story behind it? And you know, with, with that, that's when my career really started kind of taking off. You know, if I've, I mean, as, as Scott was saying, I mean, I've shown everywhere from Tokyo, Cape Town, Amsterdam, Paris, um, Tunisia. I mean, places I never in a million years would have thought that my art would have taken me. And uh, somewhere along the way, I've managed to maintain a career, raise my son, traveled the world, and somehow managed to find some harmony in an otherwise chaotic world. But with my work, th th there is a large portion of it that's 
that's fairly mundane. So it gives you a lot of time to kind of think about stuff. And so, you know, when I, when I look at like my work and, you know, say for example, like the urban landscapes, where some people might just see lights, for, for me, like, I see the, the, the light kind of being a metaphor almost for my career. You know, I, I can go out into a street scene and, and see if there's like a metal halide light or sodium light, or LED light, like, and, and each one of those casts off a different tint and how that, that light travels and whether or not it's bouncing off water or glass or, or brick or whatever else um, affects the way that it eventually arrives to your, you know, to your eyes. And that's kind of how I saw my career where I don't know what path I'm going to take, but I know that I'm going to get there. And I may bounce off a few different things along the way, but um, just like light, I'm going to illuminate whatever it is that I'm, where I'm going. And, uh, it, you know, the, there was one quote by Darwin that I've always really appreciated, which is the, it's not the strongest of the species that survives or the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And I think more than anything else, that's what, what I've tried to do over the years. So, as street art started becoming defined, I then started moving into gallery stuff, and then I started moving into mural stuff, and then, you know, when the internet kind of came up, then you start moving to that, and you gotta recognize every opportunity that comes in front of you. It's never gonna come with a big giant flag. It may be in the form of someone shaking your hand, some guy on the street being like, hey, I like that mural, but um, you always have to remain open to matter, no matter what it is. And you know, with, with my work, there's a great deal of computer work that kind of goes into it. You know, I take my photo and then I break it down to several layers, kind of idealize it, you know, take out, remove, add, whatever it may be. And that time spent at the computer gives me way too much time to think about shit. And so, you know, I started thinking like, well, what advice would, like, would I give my son? I mean, ideally you would think that like your son is a, a younger version of yourself, but my kid's a little brainiac who loves math and science, and although he appreciates art, he has no desire to be an artist or to go the art path. And so I'm faced with this dilemma of like, well, how do you impart knowledge about fields that, that aren't native to you? And so I came up with a list of 20 different bits of, of advice that I gave him. And in hindsight, it really kind of applies to any field, any profession, any age, any person. And so. With that, I'll read this list, and then if you have any questions, I'll be in the back if anyone cares to, to track me down. But the advice is this. It's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Don't be afraid to make enemies when necessary. You don't have time to be friends with everyone anyway. A good percentage of people are assholes. And if you're standing up for your beliefs, principles, and ideas, and that makes enemies, then so be it. If someone doesn't hate you or what you do, it's because they aren't noticing what you do. Jealousy and hatred will always be a byproduct of success. Prepare for it, embrace it, and wear it like a badge. Stop complaining. It can always get worse. Uh, enjoy the ride. Try not to get bent out of shape about the petty shit. None of it matters anyway. Everybody's story's in the same. Life is incredibly beautiful, and if you don't acknowledge that, you're a buffoon. Never confuse fame with success. Show up early, stay late. Be happy that you have some place to be and something to do. Don't be a dick. <laughs> Never underestimate the value of saying please and thank you. Success is always the best revenge. Your friends should be a mix of people that aspire to be like you, people that, aspire to, people that you aspire to be like, and people who are your equals. Be too stupid to quit, but smart enough to pull it off. Opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one. Don't think about them too much. People always want you to do well. Many of them don't want you to do better than they are. At a certain point, you'll be ahead of them flying blind. Recognize that you, ha you have become a leader and that people look up to you and act accordingly. Your talent should speak for itself. If you need to tell everyone you're great, you're not spending enough time working towards actual greatness. The only person you wake up to every morning is yourself. That's who you need to answer to. Think your decisions through and move with certainty. Always understand the motivations of people that you are working with. Understanding the reasons someone is trying to help you. Understand the reasons that someone's trying to keep you down. Knowing this will help you navigate potentially bad decisions. 
Loyalty is everything. The world owes you nothing. You have to earn what you get. Success should be earned. And with that, although it's fairly vague, I think in general people kind of get caught up in this art world and think if they can do this thing and that thing that they're going to jump two spaces ahead of someone. And the fact is, if you work hard every day, if you're passionate about what you do, you talk to people and you show them the passion that you have for your work, at some point that will be imparted on them and they will tell someone and it will grow. It sucks when it doesn't happen in a year or two years. For me, I started my career when I was 30. I'm 48 now. And I mean, I know people that are 24, probably making 10 times more money than I am. Sometimes the path that you want to walk down isn't the path that was meant for you. All you can do is show up for work every day, do your thing, and hope that it works out in the end. And so, thank you very much.